Um, so I'm going to introduce David George Gordon. He is the principal author of Heaven on the Half Shell, the story of an oyster in the Pacific Northwest, recently revised and updated by the University of Washington Press. He's a former uh, science writer for Washington C. Grant. Gordon has written 22 books, I didn't know that, that's crazy, on topics ranging from slugs, snails, sharks, gray whales, and sasquatch. Uh, David lives in Tacoma, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thanks. Great. Thanks, David. Thank you. There. Can you all hear me? Great. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. And, you know, I've, I was postponed two months because of that big snowstorm that hit here and saw photographs of that. And I'm glad I wasn't trying to drive anywhere during that weather. But it's kind of amazing how nice it is today. So I would applaud all of you for coming into the library today on a beautiful night where I think in, innately I'd be on my hands and knees waiting in my backyard. So. So I'm glad you're out here instead. Um, I'm going to rely heavily on slides for this. I hope you all have good enough seats where you can see it. And I should mention that this is being recorded for people who can make it today. They'll be able to get it online through the library. I also want to say Humanities Washington and I have gone back I've done a number of programs with them. I really like that program a lot. It's for any public space within uh, Washington State. And I understand that they've actually done so well this year in terms of picking people like myself as guest speakers, that the amount of people who would like to have the, talk, the, the speakers come out is like quadruples of what they usually have. And now they're actually getting really sort of persnickety about who they're going to bankroll to come out and talk. So I, I'm extremely grateful for them. I'm really grateful for being in demand. And uh, I'm grateful for you all for having me come up. So let's get started with my program. Of course, this is the title of the book. I should mention that I wrote the original manuscript for this book 21 years ago. It actually was going to be released on the original 9-11. Of course, it got postponed uh, quite a bit because no one wanted to read about oysters at that point. But, and even that six months later, people were still more focused on uh, terrorism or uh, Islam or all sorts of issues, but not so much into oysters. So I always felt like this was an overlooked uh, work of mine. And over time, things keep changing and changing. There's stuff that wasn't in the, that wasn't in the original book, There's like ocean acidification that's become very important now. And uh, 20 years is a long time, surprisingly, how much rewriting and revisiting topics in this book that I was uh, privy to the second time around. Um, I've also, this is the other book that is currently available. I've written 20 some books. Um, this one is actually about Sasquatch. And if you actually maybe see or hear or smell a Sasquatch, how to document that so the science community would actually believe you. And it's not just one of those, you, I've seen them once kind of stories which I've heard plenty of those from giving talks like this. I actually found out recently that I might be the record holder for Humanity it's Washington giving talks like this. And it was a really fun one to do because a lot of the times people in the audience have stories to contribute. I sort of felt like I created a safe enough environment that people would come forward and say, I haven't really thought about this for a long time, or this happened to me when I was a little kid, or whatever, and there was really some really lively discussion. Um, I'm hoping we have some lively discussion today, although I don't think anyone in this room is going to doubt that oysters exist. <laughs> Are we on that one? Yeah. Um, I have to ask, though, I always like to ask this question, how many people in this audience like to eat oysters? Raise your hand. Yay, my kind of people. And. The other question someone pointed out to me I should be asking is, 
How many of you are comfortable in shucking your own oysters? Oh, good. Well, I'm in the right place. Okay, like I was saying, we're not in, in doubt right now about whether oysters exist. I always talk about Sasquatch as being a fence sitter. I could kind of go either way on that one. So it's nice to be writing about something that we all know and agree are amazing and exist. Okay. Oh, where is this gentleman? Oh, there he is. There's a gentleman in, in, the, uh, in the audience wearing a hat that says, this is Indian country, basically. And yes, this is Indian country. And our relationship with oysters goes all the way back. This is actually a photograph from Mud Bay, that area near Evergreen College, near Olympia. And this is the reason it's a round photograph. I found this out later. It was taken with the first generation Kodak camera. So roll, let's roll back a little ways past when people were taking photos with their cell phones. And this photo has actually been tidied up a little bit so it's more visible. But the original one is kind of fuzzy. But it's probably one of the earliest pictures of a Native American gathering uh, shellfish right there in Mud Bay. Mud Bay, is, as you'll see, turns out to be a very significant site for shellfish and shellfish lovers and Native Americans who had villages there. The reason I love giving this talk is the reason we have so many great shellfish in Washington is you all have been doing your part about keeping the waters clean. And this is important. We wouldn't have clean water. You know, on the, every time they run a story about Chesapeake Bay in the newspaper, I think it's easy for journalists in New York to get to Chesapeake Bay on the East Coast. Well, that bay is down to like a tenth of its, of its uh, historic harvests because they weren't careful with water quality and things like uh, waste from dairy farms and industry and all sorts of stuff has really gone into wiping out a lot of the resource on the East Coast. Now there's a big project to bring oysters back into the Hudson River, which is not where I would think I'd want to get my oysters from, but historically that's been an important site on the East Coast. The West Coast, we have these scenes of really, well, just look outside. We have a be beautiful uh, habitat for oysters in particular. And it's interesting to me, I'm going to talk about three different kinds of oysters during this talk. And it's interesting to me how you all have done your part. It's actually one of these things where they do a, a state of Puget Sound report every year or every other year, and they actually use the number of healthy oyster farms as a metric to show that whether we're doing a good job or a bad job. And I'm happy to say there are more oyster farms that are being certified or recertified now than there were years ago. So instead of things going downhill, they're actually going in the right direction. Okay, the first oyster I want to talk about is ironically, it's the only native oyster that we have growing in the Northwest. This is the Olympia oyster. It's, it's conjectured that the Olympia oyster, may, its abundance may have inspired people to make the state capital down in Olympia where it is today. And that's after they, they started having a series of oyster feasts, kind of like come down and what a great place this would be if we had a capital here. So they had uh, promotional feeds of oysters and that's really where, where the idea of eating oysters really hit the mainstream. But of course, it's actually been a very uh, sought after delicacy. I look into a lot of this for redoing our book to have more than just a top uh, tip of the hat to uh, Native Americans because the culture of uh, shellfish has gone on way, way longer than we would have thought thousands of years uh, in the hands of Native Americans. This is actually a picture of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, those are the Olympic Mountains in the background. 
And I like the wooden canoe that's in here. But what I really like in this picture, if you look closely, let's see if I can find me a little red. Yeah, there it is. Look at these, all these baskets that are out here. And I'm fascinated with, with uh, the relationship between humans and animals. That's pretty much the theme that runs through all of my books. And the oyster basket has a really great story behind it. This is one that's actually in the Duwamish Museum uh, in West Seattle. And this basket is hundreds of years old. It's a museum piece. And if you look at it, you'll see that there's a lot of, there's lots of gaps in the, the weaving of this basket. That's because when people would harvest shellfish, put them in the baskets, they then put the whole basket in seawater, and when the tides came in and out, it would actually clean the oysters, get all that sand and silt and stuff out of the oysters without someone having to do that one piece at a time. So this particular style of basket may be one of the oldest tools. There's a lot, I actually read an essay about this. Uh, Ursula Le Guin, you may even know her name as a science, science fiction writer, but she has a really great essay that says, may, her father was an um, archeologist, anthropologist, by the way. So her perspective on this was male, Archaeologists think the oldest tools are things like blades or spear or arrowheads or what have you. But in actuality, she says the oldest tool is probably the basket because you need something to put stuff in there, including your kids. So I like the fact that this goes way back into early history. And because this is all natural, it's not plastic from China, um, it's amazing how long lived the baskets themselves are. They're all natural. And in this next slide, you'll see these are people excavating that area around Mud Bay in Olympia. And they're finding at the site of a, what was a seasonal village, they're finding all of these baskets that are preserved in the mud. Apparently mud is a really great way to preserve things because it creates an anoxic condition. There's no, nothing that's going to deteriorate the baskets. So these are 800-year-old baskets that they're pulling out of the mud here. In fact, one of the people who got involved in this project of, there's a wonderful museum, Squaxin Island Museum. If you're looking for something to do on a weekday, go, to, go down there to uh, the Olympia area and check out some of these artifacts and their story. But a lot of the, the, this is my friend Ed Carrier. One of the reasons I love writing books is I get to meet fascinating people that I wouldn't meet otherwise. And Ed is one of them. He's uh, in his 80s. He's a Suquamish elder. And he's been weaving baskets since he was about eight years old. His grandmother taught him to do that. So when they started pulling up these baskets, they brought Ed in to look at them. And he was like learning new styles of weaving from looking at these relics. He has baskets that are very authentic. And if you're thinking, wow, I've got to get in touch with him and get one of those baskets, well, think again, because pretty much everything he does now is being bought up as quickly as possible by museums and put into collections. So they're very hard to obtain right now. Ed just got a National Endowment for the Arts Award and his first time applying for one, this, you know, after 80 years of studying his craft, he's finally getting the recognition he really deserves. And yes, in that basket, just for size, are Olympia oysters. And Olympias are very small compared to what we see in the way of some of these other species. They're probably no bigger than this. They're delicious, and they're native. What's not to like? Native Americans now are doing a thing through archaeology and anthropology where they're redeveloping what used to be called clam gardens or shellfish gardens. And this is one up in British Columbia 
that's been rediscovered. You can see a little line of rocks that was actually put there by people to make the water quality stay, basically creating a dike to keep the, the water in the area where the oysters would want to be, protecting them from, from strong waves and all. And they're finding more and more of this. This is becoming a more of a thing. In Hawaii, for example, they're discovering. They had clam gardens too. So we sort of have a, a white perspective on, oh, well, gee, they went down and found what was on the beach and ate it. But in actuality, there's lots of evidence now. It wasn't available when I wrote the book 20 years ago uh, about how they're improving the habitat for shellfish. And that's been something that's gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nowadays, it's kind of becoming a thing. These are people carrying rocks, kind of like in a bucket brigade fashion, where they're passing one rock to the next person and down, because they're creating a new clam garden, and this is in the area not that far south of here on the mainland part of the state. Oops, come back. Okay, now we're going to jump ahead a little bit. This is like 1840s and the gold rush, which really inspired this whole interest in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, this is a, a painting of San Francisco Bay uh, before San Francisco was anything more than a small town. So we're not seeing high rises. We don't have the Bank of America building here. But what we do see, look at all those ships out there at, at, at anchor. These are all people who've come here from the East Coast primarily, thinking they're going to get rich on the gold strikes at Sutter's Mill. So when that word reached the East Coast, ships started filling with prospectors, would-be prospectors, to come here. Uh, like It's almost like the, uh, the internet, where more people are making money off of serving the internet than actually through get-rich schemes on the internet. Uh, this was a thing where the people provided the prospectors with tools and you know the things that they need for camping out in the in, in the gold fields who supplied them, they were the ones who made the money. But regardless of whether they hit struck it rich or not, what they really discovered was this the source of abundant source of oysters, that there were zillions of these uh, native Olympia oysters to be had. In fact, the title of my book, Heaven on the Half Shell, comes from Mark Twain. This is a young <coughs> Mark Twain in this picture. He was working as a, like a cub reporter, a journalist, uh, in San Francisco during the gold rush. And of course, being a writer, I can certainly relate to this. He was hungry all the time. And he found this one particular hotel that was famous for its happy hours of oysters. So he wrote back then, this area is heaven on the half shell. And that expression has stuck a lot this so long. I'm actually really happy that we were able to use that line for our book. The oysters themselves, I mentioned they're small, so it's a little hard to really judge the scale here. But oysters grow in, these Olympia oysters grow, tend to grow in clumps on big oysters with little oysters on them, and that's kind of the way things work. Uh, to harvest the oysters from San Francisco Bay, they would use this technology and these boats called bateaux, French Canadian term, and a Cajun term, and they have these really long rakes. They're like they're like uh, hinged. It's almost like what you'd serve your salad with only in grand scale, they could reach down, pull up a clump of oysters, put them in the boat, that's what you see here in the bateau. And it seemed to work out great as a, as a means for harvesting. Now, this unfortunately was not a good thing because it was harvesting, but it wasn't really farming. There was no replenishing going on. 
And it was only a matter of time before they pretty much plucked the last oysters out of San Francisco Bay. Yeah, a shucking hand plant like this was a super busy place. But you see, they're not, they're not going for demure half-shell oysters. So basically, these guys are busting apart those clumps and extracting the oysters they can. So I think half-shell oysters were slower to catch on. But uh, nowadays, that's the thing. If you have a beautiful looking oyster with a beautiful uh, piece of flesh in there, you're set. So they did start running out of oysters in San Francisco Bay. There was like a hysteria, now what do we do? And they started sending people out to find other oyster beds elsewhere. They looked as far south as Mazatlan, Mexico. So they were going all the way down the Pacific coast. And finally they struck upon the real source, which was Willapa Bay in Washington. At that point it was known as Shoalwater Bay. This is James Swan. I hope you know about him. He's a, he wrote a book that was basically six years in Shoalwater Bay. And he was actually working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Quite a colorful character, I would have to say. I hope I'm not defaming his memory, but he was a little bit of a... He had a, a penchant for drinking too much. And a lot of what he wrote about Native Americans, he gets sent out on these explorations to record the histories of different tribes. But a lot of that stuff never really, it was like a dog ate my homework. It never really resulted in actual uh, documents. Uh, this one that he was using, the Shoalwater Bay one, does exist, but a lot of his stuff did not come back. In fact, this big story was that all of his drafts of his manuscript fell off, off of a canoe, native canoe. And that's the dog that ate his homework. But in that, if you find the, the uh, history of Shoalwater Bay, Willaba, there. You can see not only are there some really in interesting anecdotes, like why you shouldn't cook a skunk, unless you want to throw away your cookware. That was in the book. That was one thing I picked up from reading it. But a lot of great line illustrations like this one. This shows what people used to do. And you can see the guy standing up in the canoe is a European settler. And he's hired on a bunch of Native Americans to help him harvest. Again, this is not farming. This is wild harvesting the resource that was there. So eventually, you know, we like to think things go on for forever, but that also became a problem in terms of harvesting too much. And they're basically waiting for the tides to go out so they can get access to those beds of naturally occurring beds of oysters. This is a photograph of Charles, a drawing of Charles Russell's house. Charles Russell was one of the early settlers in uh, European settlers in Willapa Bay. And James Swan writes, he's the one who actually brought the first shipment of oysters from Willapa Bay to San Francisco. You can read about this in newspapers from that time. It was like a big cause for celebration. The oysters are back. And in that book, uh, Swan says, he thinks that Charles Russell should actually have should actually have a statue to his name for that feat of bringing oysters to San Francisco. He also says that statue should be made out of oyster shells. I still think it would be a good idea. So someday you may drive down to Willapa and there'll be a beautiful oyster shell construction to Charles Russell. The large house in here is Charles Russell's. The smaller house here is actually from Chief Toke, who was a, a, a Chinook uh, Native American and one of the people who helped get James Swan on the right track in terms of chronicling that area. Okay, Olympia oysters stayed popular for a surprisingly long time. 
This can is obviously not from 1849, much more recent, probably 1930s. And they still were, you know, people got more and more sophisticated with the way they would actually raise the oysters. And that really helped things out, helped become, that's where farming, where the whole concept of farming oysters really started was with improvements, the harvests of the natural, improving the, the habitat for the naturally occurring stocks. I'm really grateful to people like Betsy Peabody, that's the woman in this picture, who has a group called Puget Sound Restoration Fund. And Betsy's been doing work all over the Puget Sound region and working with other people. There's a whole other group that's doing the same thing in San Francisco to make sure that the habitats are still conducive to raising native oysters. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, of course, I like eating them, so can't fight with that. But they're also really valuable in creating habitat for all sorts of other animals because they're much smaller than the other kinds of oysters. They create little niches that are much smaller. And this photo is a little misleading because that's one of those little shore crabs. It looks big in this picture. But it's not that big, it's not Dungeness crab. Little creatures like this just really benefit from the little niches that the oysters are making, and that's a good reason to have them, just for supporting all the other life on the tide's edge. I'm going to jump really quickly to another oyster that is grown in Washington, but actually, in this case, is not native, came from uh, the East Coast, the Eastern Oyster. I really like these. Have you ever tried any of these? Uh, Eastern oysters that are raised in Hood Canal area, I think because of the salinity difference or something, and all the nutrition, the nu nutrients that are out there, uh, makes them really, they're larger, they're plumper, they're my idea of a good time. And interesting point of history, as soon as they connected the Transcontinental Railway, so going from, uh, the East Coast to the West Coast, when they drove the Golden Spike and connected that railway, what do you think was on that train? Barrels of oysters from the East Coast. Back then, they didn't have this ethic about non-native species, non-indigenous species. They were like, this is a great place to grow oysters. Let's bring the barrels of them by train out to Washington, dump them into the water, let them grow and harvest those. So there's a big booming industry based around Eastern, the non-native oysters. That's what's in these barrels, of course. The problem, though, is they didn't really reproduce well in the colder waters here than what they were used to in the Atlantic Ocean. So it was a great idea on paper, but it didn't really pay off very well. Nonetheless, there was, enormous, there was this enormous industry. Um, this is an old can label. And you can just tell from the drawing of the, the oyster, this is an Eastern oyster. It's not a Pacific or a Olympic, Olympia oyster. This is actually one of my favorite slips of paper, because a find like this tells so much. This is actually a receipt from someone who was buying oysters. Each date on the far left here, those are dates that someone then bought lots of 200 oysters at a time. And look at that, what was it? Basically they bought, uh, well I'm just trying to tally up here, a couple of thousand oysters for a whopping $30. Those were the days. You can see at the very bottom of this list, there's even an item, two oyster knives. So those were the days when you could get items like that for cheap. But it didn't last, like I said, it was a great idea. 
on paper, but not in reality. What we do have now in Willapa Bay and places like that where these eastern oysters were introduced, this is actually an eastern or Atlantic oyster drill. These are little, little shellfish. They're gastropods, they're actually snails. And they actually have a drill on them, as the name implies, an oyster drill that allows them to drill holes through the shell of an oyster, stab it with a little hypodermic needle that's part of their tongue, and then uh, inject it with poison that dissolves the meat of the oyster so that the drill can then suck up that kind of like an oyster flavored milkshake and get its nutrients. So, this thing is in abundance in most areas where they were importing those oysters. They brought in those drills. There are native drills, but these are a non-native drill as well. So serious oyster farmers have different techniques for how to get rid of different kinds of these nuisance drills. The other thing that came in with the, the eastern oysters with Spartina. This is a non-native cordgrass that grows on beaches. And it's actually, I went to a museum, uh, an aquarium on the East Coast, and they had an exhibit showing how marvelous this stuff was. Because it's part of the habitat. But out here, there are no natural enemies of Spartina, nothing that would eat it or keep its numbers down. And you wind up with these giant marshes which are basically holding all this mud in and changing the habitat from a sandy beach to a muddy beach. Well, it took them a long time. Certainly at the time I wrote the original book, they didn't know what to do to get rid of this stuff. It was taking over Willapa Bay. In more recent times, they've, been, they've invented all sorts of technologies to get rid of the Spartina, the non-native cordgrass. So, this is less relevant than it was 20 years ago. Makes me happy that we're doing something right and getting things back to the way they ought to be. Now the real excitement begins, because the Pacific Oyster is the one that really was a game changer for people on the West Coast. I wonder how many of you, I know there are some people here in the audience who raise oysters themselves. How many of you have Pacific oysters in your beds? Yeah, that's pretty much the go-to oyster. I know these photographs are not the best. This is, like, this is not really a how-to guide. But one thing you'll notice is they have very raggedy edges. And that's probably an easy way to distinguish when you find a shell on a beach, whether it's what species of oyster it is. This is a receipt from 1905. We like to think that people were bringing oysters successfully from Japan in the 1920s. That's really where things started taking off. But in actuality, people were trying to bring in oysters from Japan in the early 1900s, 1905 in this case, without success. They weren't really taking off. And someone figured out along the way what they really needed to do, instead of bringing adult oysters on the deck of a ship where they have to keep them wet, you know, hosing down with seawater and all that, it was very stressful for the oysters themselves. Uh, what they could do is bring little, little oysters growing on little pieces of shell. We would call this oyster seed. And who taught us this? Well, Japanese people had been harvesting oysters in Japan for centuries as well. That's a, kind of a, a livelihood that was much venerated. And most of the people who started working in the oyster biz when Japanese oysters started to be cultivated on the West Coast were Japanese. They're actually, in this case, holding these strings of shells because it turns out that oysters really like attaching to the shells of adult uh, oysters. In fact, the term, the scientific name for the Pacific oyster, conchophila, means oyster loving, or excuse me, shell loving. This is that 
this I cribbed this picture from another textbook, but you can see that things all oops, oh, come back. Things all start down here with the adult oysters, who release gametes, eggs and sperm, into the water column, and they just kind of this is called broadcast spawning. I love that term. Um, they're just basically letting the oysters, baby oysters, fend for themselves for most of their lives as they evolve and develop and eventually create shells and then settle and wind up adding, contributing to this big clump because they're growing on the shells of mom and dad, whether they knew it or not. So the Japanese were very aware of this cycle and how to benefit from it. And that's how they started bringing in these little, the oyster seed, little, and it keeps getting smaller and smaller bits of shell that we can use and scatter around on the beach and start a bed of oysters. I'm wondering if that's how you all got into the biz in the first place, by scattering seed on your property. No. Were they already there? Uh, no, the water. Um for the Pacific oysters and most of the oysters up here, they don't propagate at least this far north because the water is too cold. So we uh, we actually have uh, diploid and triploid uh, Pacific oysters, and they don't breed. Yeah. Uh, so we're not in the same situation as in Hood Canal, where the oysters gotcha. can actually propagate. They don't propagate here. Technically, they don't propagate here, but. One of the questions I have is I am seeing some oysters now growing on rocks and they shouldn't be there if they aren't able to propagate. So there is another oyster that uh, is, I'm not sure what it is, but it's not a Pacific and it's attaching to rocks. So I'll be curious as to what you know about that. So it must be propagating. But, so we buy this fat and then put it in bags and then they don't propagate. Gotcha. But maybe other people do other things. Yeah, I, and I, you know this, this thing about triploid or diploid yeah. or... I, they're non-breeding. Yeah, they, those are the so-called sexless oysters yeah. that were developed a while ago when they were trying to combat this thing called summer mortality. In the summertime, a lot of oysters would die. Well, how do we get around that? Well, it turns out people thought at that point it was because the oysters are dying because they were weakened from spawning. Sounds like a frightening thought for people. <laughs> but well, there it, are, I have grown other oysters, but they haven't done as well as in Pacific. Yeah, the, one, and the ones that are not using all the good stuff to make eggs and sperm seem to do better. So someone invented a way of creating oysters that are actually mutant oysters that will grow, uh, have multiple sets of chromosomes. A lot of our GMO crops are like that too. And in fact, the one person who was advising me this, with this said, if you have an attitude about that, just imagine going to the grocery store without having all those GMO products. So it's not, it's not Frankenstein's monster, it's actually a real beneficial, if used properly, uh, beneficial at attribute for for oyster growing. This photograph sh is showing those big crates. Each one of those crates has multiple bags of oyster seed from Japan. So a lot of times growers, the bigger growers in Puget Sound area would actually pool their money so that they could bring out an enormous shipment from Japan and get started this way. Well, it seemed like a great way to go right up until the advent of World War II. Now, we weren't having any trade at all with Japan. In fact, where they dropped the A-bomb in Hiroshima was originally a great oyster area. You wouldn't want oysters from Hiroshima after they polluted it with uh, New, the nuclear peril. So this was the way to go for a really long time. Eventually they got to the point where there were so many oysters already in Washington and on the west coast, going all the way down to northern California, that they didn't need to import oyster seed at all during the, the uh, war years, World War II. They were actually, they were actually 
reproducing on their own. This is probably my favorite boat photograph in this entire show. This, this dapper gentleman is uh, Masahide Yamashita, a Japanese uh, person who moved to America, became a jeweler in Seattle, and also started importing, helping people import seed from Japan. That's really where he was making his money as a broker for oyster seed. This little guy sitting on his lap is Jerry Yamashita. And I, Jerry was around when I worked on the first book 20 years ago. Here's what Jerry looked like up until quite recently. He passed away in January at the age of 101. Still had a great business with oysters. And if you read the book, you'll see some really eye eyebrow raising stories about what these people had to endure during World War II. They were already established here, they were taken off of their properties, they couldn't even get down there to visit without breaking the rules, and um, wound up spending a lot of their lives in internment camps. In Jerry's case, he came back, re reclaimed his land around the Bellingham area, and uh, started uh, his business again. He's a really wonderful man, and I really am proud to have spent some time with him. Uh, this is Trevor Kincaid. He's a University of Washington guy who set up a, a, he's a scientist. He actually created the biology program at the University of Washington. So we have him to thank for a lot. But also he was very interested in the science behind oyster growing and helped keep the things under, in balance so that they didn't have to worry about shortages and the good years, the bad years, and all that. This was a result of scientific involvement in that early stages of farming. Oysters as far as the eye can see, I just love that. And you know, the crews, the nature of the crews changed a lot. It wasn't so much eventually relying on uh, Japanese help. There actually, and I talk about this in the book as well, there was a series of people who were used, uh, starting with Native Americans, moving on to Chinese, moving on to Japanese, uh, South American, Central American, basically anyone who was willing to do peace work for little money, do backbreaking work. And so there was this long history of that. This is, a, I love this picture because I always think, this guy, why that's me, the boss. <laughs> and everyone else is working hard. Who's the muddiest in this picture? But not this guy, that's for sure. But you can see the, the fruits of their labor. Those are enormous barges when as soon, soon as the tides come back in, and they float out, they get moved into other areas. But look at the quantity of what a harvest would be like with a work crew like that. Things have changed over the years, in more recent years. This is a photograph of, again, in Hood Canal, Hamahama oysters. They're working at night, because the tides are right at this point. But you'll see it's not about growing oysters, scattering them around on the bottom anymore. They're actually in plastic bags. And this is a really good way to go. It keeps the oysters safe. They're not on the bottom where they're having to contend with sea stars or drills or any of that, the predators. And in fact, they actually turn out to be a really good thing for, let's see if I can get this on my next slide. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Before I get into that, I should tell you that this is a high-tech device called a flopsy. If you're playing Scrabble, I think of that word, flopsy, that's a good one. And it actually stands for a floating upwelling system. You can't really see it in this picture, but you can see that it is solar powered which is giving it an advantage. This is right off the coast of uh, Vancouver Island. And in there are little, like almost like Ferris wheels, 
that are turning around and exposing the oysters to the best plankton, the best food for them to grow. So the little oysters are encouraged to become bigger oysters. Then they can bring them back in and put them out for harvests. But what I really was going to say is those bagged oysters that we saw momentarily, let's look at this one. These are tidally flipped bags. Instead of having someone go out and turn each bag every day, which is kind of like the way they grow, raise, create champagne, very labor intensive, to just have someone come out and flip the bags, that's a good way of making sure that they're actually tumbled. I'm going to go back one. There we go. Flipped or tumbled oysters. Those are Pacific oysters. They're raised in those bags. And because of, in this case, the tides that do the work, they have floats on each one of these bags. So when the tide comes in, the bags go up. The oysters all kind of tumble in the bag. The tides go down. The oyster bags are lowered nicely. And this kind of is like the same as polishing rocks. If you like to have jewel, you know, ro rock ornaments, um, this is very, a very similar thing. It actually s scrapes off all those rough, fluted edges that we saw in the Pacific oysters earlier, and we get really beautiful-looking oysters. It also makes oysters that are deeper uh, cups. There's much more meat in one of these oysters because they kind of don't know which way is up. So it's a good invention. But the other thing I like showing in this picture is it's becoming a woman-dominated field. It's surprising to me. There's actually a group of women I know who are the daughters of oyster, as long-established oysters uh, or growers, mostly men at that point. But now it's becoming a women's thing. And there's actually a group of women called the Oyster Divas I just love that name. This all these women who now have these companies that were created by their dads. This is uh, Chelsea Farms, if you ever go down to Olympia. Uh, that's where, that's a woman run, excuse me, woman run business. It's not that big of a deal because when you think about it during World War II when all the men were off fighting the war, women became very, uh, empowered to work in these uh, oyster plants. And that's kind of one of the, everyone likes Rosie the Riveter, but here's in actuality uh, a woman oyster shucker. And, but not just that kind of stuff, not just waitressing. There are people that run hatcheries and have the technology, they went, they went to uh, school that probably in part inspired by Trevor Kincaid at the University of Washington. And it's a women, it's become a woman's thing. I like this a lot because, you know, the whole business about the tides and Venus on the half shell and all that kind of stuff, the, the it's a female energy kind of a, now it sounds like a new age or here. It's a female endeavor and it's a good field for them as well. Which is a nice, let me grab my notes here. This is the only time I really need them. This is a nice intro to, this is, this is um, Anne Harold. She's also from Willapa Bay. And what I like, the, the reason I would like to kind of go out on this theme is that Anne is actually a fifth generation oyster grower. And I wound up getting photographs courtesy of her. That's where I need the notes. This is her great grandfather, Roy, who was probably growing eastern oysters when this photograph was taken way back when, but later switched over to Pacific oysters when it proved to be more lucrative. So that's her great-grandfather. Here's her, her uh, grandfather, Harlan, sitting on a, what a historic oyster boat. And here's her father, John. And that, yes, that's Anne Harold in that picture. 
So a lot of these businesses are uh, multi-generational. I really like that. A lot of the, the humanities of Humanities Washington is about people and their heritage, and there's a lot of that family-run heritage in the oyster industry as well. I really appreciate that. Of course, we have recipes in the book, and I struggled a lot to not make the book just a cookbook, so I wanted all the recipes to have a relevance to what we were talking about, which of course meant, for example, including this dish, these are actually smoked oysters that are using lavender to give them a, a flavor, the smoking, putting that in a, a barbecue or into an oven. And um, also from that area around uh, Squim, Washington, where lavender has become an introduced crop and much valued. So we've introduced oysters, introduced crop, but the basic recipe is like what Native Americans would have done. And that would be this, to uh, clear a little area on the beach, put rocks in there, start a fire, heat the rocks, put seaweed down as a kind of a little blanket, and put oysters in there. And if you're like me and you get lazy about shucking oysters, this is a great way to go, because just putting them into that heat eventually opens the oysters themselves. So no shucking knife is needed. So it's sort of like what goes around comes around. Uh, throughout history, we, have a, we seem to have a, a trend for picking on something, developing it, discarding it, coming up with another perspective of it. And this is a great example of that. I think this picture was given to me by that gentleman, uh, the basket maker, Ed Carrier. And that's basically his meal for the day. Again, I want to applaud all of us here for helping keep water quality good, and that's basically what we need to keep oysters going in this part of the world. So we've done a pretty good job. I don't want anyone to get so self-assured that they think we don't continue to need to do that, because we really do, and we're really fortunate where we are right now. Washington leads the nation in terms of shellfish production. Let's keep it that way. Okay, the last picture I want to show before we open it up to questions, and I hope some of you have some good ones. Don't you think this is a great logo? <laughs> I'm just waiting for someone to produce a t-shirt with that. <laughs> I'd buy it. It's a smiling oyster. Someone said they thought it looked a lot like the same guy who does planters peanuts. But from way back when, I just had to throw that in there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for listening to me at this point. I'm wondering who has questions that they'd like to bring up. Anybody? Yeah. Um, I knew nothing about oysters until today. Sorry, I don't actually like to eat them, but I'm very curious about the pearls. And is it only certain breeds of oysters that generate pearls? You know, about whether whether uh, just oysters produce pearls is actually most of the bivalves have the capacity to do that. You know, you probably know this story, but but oysters when they have an irritant, a grain, grain of sand or something that's in their soft flesh inside their shell. They don't have hands to reach in and grab it and throw it out. So what they do is they actually secrete uh, another layer. Uh, uh, it's a pearlescent, shiny layer of calcium that basically turns that irritant into something lustrous and smooth and desirable if you're a jeweler. It's a good invention. And to answer your question, all of these bivalves have the capacity to do that, even gooey duck clams. Even tridacnas, those ones you see in 1950s movies that catch, catch pearl divers and drown them or whatever, can produce 
pearls. In that same reason, to avoid irritants. But unfortunately, a lot of those pearls are not very lustrous or attractive. In fact, some of them are just like little basic balls of chalk. They look like someone had thrown a piece of chalk into the oyster. And even the oysters that you get in the shucking house from Pacific oysters, they'll find, they'll find pearls in them from time to time. Most people wind up with a little collection of them if they've been working as a shucker. But a lot of them are kind of funky looking. They're not rock. The ones that we really value are actually created artificially using oysters and using a specific kind of oyster to get that luster. So everyone can do it, but whether we want their pearls or not, that's entirely our perspective. All right. Anyone else? Yes. Do you have any uh, suggestions on uh, shucking larger oysters? Because if you go back, it, normally you would do it at the hinge, but uh, I found that the shell breaks when you do that. And if you have any, you happen to know. You know, just for a little bit of background, because I thought this was entertaining, the, the oysters, it's like the zucchini in your garden that got away. The, after about two years, they reached a good, what we would like to have for, for edible oysters. But if you forget that they're there, they continue five years later, and now they're the, what they call, I like this term, tennis shoe oysters. Because <laughs> they look like the size of a tennis shoe. And I don't really have much of a suggestion there other than trying to uh, bake them. So you don't, don't have to do that fight of getting in with the hinge and it's almost impossible from my experience to get them opening without cracking them. So that's the way to go for me. But also, they aren't that tasty. The larger doesn't, doesn't always equate to better tasting and the optimum size, is, like I said, is probably about two years of growth. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. All right, well, I do want to mention that, I, that the uh, local bookstore is selling copies of my book here. I'm happy to autograph personalized copies for you. And I, I think they also brought in some of the Sasquatch books so you can read about how to document what you see. Thank you. And I'm going to stick around and I'll talk to you all individually, too. So thank you very much. Thank you.